All right, what, uh, what stood out uh, in your reading uh, that you did? Uh, this included basic Bible interpretation, correct? Um, and did you have other reading in addition to that other than the passage? No, just the... Okay, it was just the basic Bible reading, okay. Or did you have... I thought we had a chapter. No, 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 it was the first. We had a chapter in the book. We had a chapter, chapter, we had a chapter in this book. We didn't have oh, you had, a, you had a chapter in both, and you're in the... Yes, okay. And uh, what stood out? I was a lot saying, to digest. Oh, no, I was just saying a lot to digest. One of the things that stood out to me was just the, uh, the definition of parable, which went a little beyond what I assumed the parable was. Okay, what does he say uh, a parable is? Uh, do, you, do you know where it's at in, in the text of, of the text? Yeah. Because I think that's, that's always helpful uh, so that we're all on the same page, and I don't have a copy in front of me. So... Um, I liked how it, um, he broke down the parables to like, there was um, seed parables, there were nature parables, sermon parables, and he made it very understandable in having classifications of them and characteristics of different things and not also trying to pull more from a parable than is there, mm. where you tend to do it, where the allegorization happens. Excellent. Did anybody else find that, what, how he defines a parable? He says that it's a form of figurative language there involving a comparison. That's one of the first parts. Come on in. <coughs> oh, my goodness. No, just kidding. <laughs> See, we, we've shut out those, uh, those who are outside. Welcome. All right, say it again. Figurative language. Involving comparisons. There we go. Involving comparisons. Okay. Where do we most often find parables? New Testament. Okay. Only place? Nope. So we need to be careful and wise that we are not uh, limiting the text of Scripture uh, by maybe where we expect to find things more off, most often. So that's good. Uh, what else did you like out of this section? <coughs> to me, it was interesting about the allegories and was it Augustine? Mm -hmm. But he said that all that stuff about the one parable. Was... Yeah, there's some pretty pretty intense uh, uh, allegorization of scripture. So. And then it says a parable is a single truth. Mm -hmm. So. Can there, can there be multiple applications from the text of Scripture? I think we all agree that the answer is yes, uh, but we want to get to that single meaning of the text of Scripture. So we want to make sure we're not speaking outside of the realm of what is stated. Anything else that uh, stood out to you? Was there anything that troubled you as well? It just goes along with several of the other chapters for me where growing up and in a lot of the churches that I went to, like allegorizing and bringing other things into the passages, like here it was talking about, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything, you know, the parable of the ten virgin, virgins, it doesn't say what the oil in the lamp is. And I'm like, how many sermons have I been to in my life where the oil has been this and it's that? And just, like, making me look for, you know, even when someone's giving a good, you know, a sermon on something that isn't a bad thing, like, be very, pay a lot of close attention to the text and be like, can you get there from what's here? Or are you adding in? Because when you start adding in, even if it's good things over here, that's when we lead to not so good things over there. <laughs> In the preparation uh, for talking about the class and what was being covered, uh, we started, uh, Pastor Huber, Pastor Efta, and I started talking about the, the Jesus and the boat and the calming of the waves and, you know, that the fact that Jesus calms the storms of your life may absolutely be a true statement, but that is not the point of that passage. It's not the point of the text, so. And then we, we got a little silly and 
<laughs> Pastor Huber and I, Pastor Efta did not. But. <laughs> Where a lady was saying the point of that story is to have friends around you that will point you to Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not a bad, you know, that's not a bad message. Have friends around you, but that is not anywhere in that story. <laughs> no, that is not the point of scripture. But so we need to be very cautious which is a lead-in to what we're going to be doing here. We want to be very cautious that we don't get into application, um, because especially in this passage that we're dealing with, that would be the natural outflow, there are some explicit commands that we can go right to and say, all right, this is what I must do. Um, but we also don't want to get into interpretation. We want to stay at the level of observation. So if you haven't already, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 uh, is going to provide us uh, plenty to talk about. And uh, just about the time where you start thinking we've covered it all, hopefully we'll be able to uncover even more in, in this concept of observation. Um, so you might have already done your work and written it down. Uh, I hope you have done a little bit of work and wrote, written a little bit down. If not, follow along um, and we'll make sure that we are covering. And if at any point... Uh, you think that we are getting into this idea of interpretation or application, feel free to say so, because I might not miss it as I get wrapped up into what we're doing. But we're going to start uh, right off at the beginning, uh, and I will kick off the first one, and then hopefully we'll be able to go from there, and I won't have to ask too many more questions. Who is speaking? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. What else do we observe? The crowds are there. How do you know? Well, I actually went back to Matthew 5, where he kind of started talking. And it said, when Jesus saw the crowds coming up on a mountain, and it seems to be all the same. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. I would agree. Um, <laughs> that's, that's his audience. Yeah, and his audience, it talks about disciples, but they're not the 12 yet. The disciples are... The big, it's not the 12, it's disciples. He has called some by that time, but he hasn't got all 12 called yet. Okay. And this is in conjunction with the Sermon on the Mount. This is a long dissertation that includes the Sermon on the Mount. So Tim, hopefully that you are uh, noticing we're starting to apply what we're talking about in our other study. Uh, we're, we're talking about the context within uh, the book. All right, what else do we have? Let's stay on the observational level. Uh, who is writing? How do you know? Okay, that's, that, that seems so basic, but how do we know Matthew wrote Matthew? <laughs> Hopefully you have a good Bible that tells you. I'm like, I don't get that one from the text. Ooh, good. Good. No, that's good. So. Okay, so we, we've got uh, the understanding uh, from, from uh, extra outside of uh, biblical history that tells us Matthew wrote Matthew. As long as you believe Matthew wrote Matthew, there are going to be those who say Matthew did not. That's a whole other discussion uh, that you may have already had within this class, and, and if not, that will come later. Um, but here, we believe Matthew wrote Matthew. And who is Matthew's audience? The Hebrews. The Jews, rather. Yes. Wasn't it uh, Church of Antioch? So doesn't this fall into uh, interpretation? Ooh, does it? Yeah. Or is this observation? This is, well, this is, well, observation is going to come from my text. Interpretation is going to come from outside of my text. Okay, yeah, it's going to so come this from. This is all biblical background information. So. Biblical background observation. There we go. Literary context 
is one of those things that we need to remember that begins into the realm of interpretation. We're breaking that barrier. And it's so easy to do because you're like, oh, I'm just, I'm going naturally. So yes, we want to pull it back to what are we dealing with here? What, what are we trying to expose? We're trying to expose the text. And so what are the observations of the text? Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Okay, those are, those are really good places to start. Uh, we can even start with that first uh, sentence and even that first phrase within the first sentence. What are the observations? Okay, therefore. So this is part of another pericope. This is part of a greater pericope. Uh, we need to make sure to understand what is the literary form that we're dealing with here. Narrative. Okay, it's narrative uh, from, from Matthew's point. Uh, from Jesus' standpoint, it is what? Seems like it's um, wisdom. I mean, isn't it? Um, it's a sermon, it, it's a homily, uh, it, it's a discourse that, that Jesus is giving. So. <laughs> So we need to make sure that we understand what's going on within the, the text. We have the, the narrative of Matthew being given, and we have Jesus specifically giving a homily. Uh, Jesus, because we've already identified out of Matthew chapter 5 what is going on, uh, he would be the I that you see uh, in verse 25. And, and who is he speaking to? Who is he telling? You, the crowd. Okay. And, and then that would lead us to ask? Who is the crowd? Okay. Who is the crowd? And uh, we've dealt with that. And what does he tell them? You're not being anxious. Okay. Uh, how do we handle that? What, what questions should that bring up in our mind that are not interpretation, but are observation? Anxious about what? Okay. Okay. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, all seems to be physical. That gives us that gives a big list, doesn't it? I mean, we've got a lot of things we can deal with there, and it would be so easy to start detailing those out and create this beautiful homily. Do not get into interpretation. The other two, Caution yourself. Oh, go ahead. The other two who is one of them Solomon, and the other is our heavenly Father. Okay. Well, there's also the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, yes. Okay, so we've got Gentiles, Solomon. <coughs> Who else? You said JW, you said one other one? Heavenly Father. Yeah, God the Father was. There another one. Well, you didn't have to. I mean, you had the audience of Jesus yeah. too, so I think it was really fine. Okay. You could almost consider the plants, uh, the lilies, and the uh, you know the birds as who, because they're being used in a way that reflects kind of a human. Okay. And there's yeah. something being said yeah. about them. Yeah, I could see how you could get there. I don't. I don't even have a problem with that. Um, Let's, let's stick with verse 25 for a moment, going back to verse 25. Uh, within uh, verse 25, uh, what is the argument? What is happening? To whom is it happening? What's going on? Uh, is, is this uh, something that we, not getting into interpretation, but is it instruction? Is it a command? What, what is the structure of this passage? Yeah, there is a command. There is a command. Okay. 
Uh, is there anything within the text, within this passage, that's repeated uh, in regards to that? If you've already read through it. Okay, so that's going to give us weight for interpretation later. For observation, it's also going to give us some uh, understanding that uh, there's, there's repetition. And anytime you see repetition, you want to make sure to note that. Uh, make sure to note the amount of space that is being given there. Also, he starts here, but there's a lot of questions. He asks mm. a lot of rhetorical mm. questions. Okay. And, and what are the implied answers uh, to those questions are going to be things you're going to deal with in interpretation. Uh, they're going to be things that you need to note and be aware of in observation. Um, so in regards to uh, the who, the what, and the where, uh, where is this taking place? It was alluded to. Galilee. Okay. Which is in? Northern Israel. It was the place they did most of the ministry. You've been self near most of the disciples in Galilee. And it's kind of where Jesus was home base in uh, If we have uh, been uh, reading along um, in the book of Matthew, uh, we understand uh, the events that are happening. Jesus has been in Galilee, uh, and he's been there for some time, according to uh, the end of uh, chapter 4. Here's my question. I was I had written down Syria just because and um, is Syria near Galilee? Because I was looking at like verses twenty three on, and I I thought he wasn't like still in Galilee because then it talked about Syria and then they said they followed him from the other. So I was confused. That's where all Syria's. the people came from that were part of all the two. Okay. Okay. Syria is just north of it. Okay. Yeah. And then it says he's on a mountain. So is that like there's obviously mountains in that? I had a, I, I just took a class on um, the, the narratives earlier this year, and uh, my, my professor of that class is like, get that, get that concept of a mountain out of your mind. Okay. It's, it's a glorified hill. Um, but then he said walking up, but it feels like a mountain, so, because he takes tours there every year. Um, it, it, it would be a mountain in Kansas. Um, it may not be a mountain if you've been to Denver. It might not feel like much of a mountain when you look at it. Uh, it is a, definitely a raised hill uh, um, near the Sea of Galilee. So I thought that was a funny way that he said that. Um, so we, we've got some idea of where it's taking place. Uh, when is this taking place? I just wrote early in Jesus' ministry, but yep. So, what do we know, uh, ministry, about early in Jesus' ministry? Uh, we know he still didn't have all his disciples yet. Okay, so, not all disciples. We know he still had a, uh, at this point, he was still quite popular. So he, he didn't quite have the uh, animosity had he done the water into the wine at this point? Is that chronological? Had he done that? It, it is chronological. It would have been post-Cana. Okay. In this getting into interpretation then? I mean, it's so that, that gets us into to a fine line because we want to make sure that we are staying with the win of the text um, and we want to make sure that we're staying within the win of the account we're in. So we could easily get into the realm of, all right, we're in the post or the pre-cross, um, we're in the uh, Second Temple Judaism. That would all be interpretation. Um, but speaking about the fact that we are post-birth of Jesus, he is God become flesh, he's dwelling on the earth. Matthew's already told us all of this. Post-Cana is fine, uh, the wedding at Cana. Um, because at the end of chapter 4, we already see that he is uh, doing healing and he's uh, healing disease and he's preaching the coming kingdom of God. So um, other things, you know, the fact that it's under the Roman uh, Empire with the Herod's control and all that's going on there, that would get into interpretation uh, because it would have severe implication for the text. So we, we might be able to say, 
uh, post Bethlehem, um, but we want to draw that line carefully. Um, and then make sure that we're not getting into the effects of Herod and what he did and how, how he impacted the nation, because we will do a lot of that in interpretation. Why is such a tough question. Why is this passage included in all of what God could have said in the text of Scripture? And again, that why, that could easily lead us into interpretation. Um, that God put this passage in the realm of Matthew, post-resurrection, for the early church, for believers. Let's make sure we're pausing and we're not getting into all of that. And we're saying within this, God become flesh, is speaking to the crowds of the people, and he is speaking on the occasion of the crowds gathering around him. So, again, we want to differentiate those two things. The why of what he is doing, the people are around him and he's gathering, you know, he is teaching them, and the why did God specifically give this passage of text, that's interpretation. Does that make sense? You guys see those two differences, JW? This passage of text is also linked Part of the reason this one is here is because it starts for this reason, and he's answering what the reason is. So, I mean, part of it's there to finish up on what he was doing in verse 24. Which is a perfect lead into the wherefore. So, which actually is in our text in the start of verse 25. Where else do we see a therefore in this passage? You cannot serve God in wealth. Well, it's right on the heels of the It's right on the heels of the tone. Quit focusing on this world and focus on the next. And then he says, therefore, and you almost hear him saying, well, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to do if I'm always worried about this? He says, listen, don't worry about that. You know, and so that's why I think it's right on the heels. That's why he says, therefore, um, don't worry about these other things. Be be cautious, because that, that, that's absolutely true. That therefore leads in very clearly to what's going on. That gets very uh, application, um, interpretation gets really blended in that moment. So make sure you're keeping that uh, separate. What happened immediately preceding, uh, Jeremy just told us, which is very kind, uh, store your treasures in heaven. What happened before that? And I don't just mean walk back section by section through this passage. In, in what Matthew has said, what is going on previously? So we need to make sure that we are, are keeping in mind those questions to be able to come to this text and ask more questions. Um, I like that in, in bringing up this pay passage, uh, you brought up, Jeremy, the uh, concept of how do I pay my bills. So what does Jesus say uh, in verse 26? Does it say you are much more valuable? Uh, let me see, where does it say? It has to return. Oh, are you? <laughs> Make sure you're noting those questions. Make sure you're noting uh, what is being uh, explicitly said and what is being implied and asked. But you're exactly right. We, when we get to the interpretation and the application side, we get to see some really great things. Um, he, he tells us to observe. This is a... a common thing that we see throughout the text of scripture. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, we are told to observe the ant. Uh, we're also told to observe uh, others uh, in, in scripture. Here it's saying, observe the birds of the air. What do the birds not do? Yeah, they're in the barns. Sour. 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 Yeah. And, and what, what happens to them, though they don't do those things? Okay, so those are questions you can be asking yourself in light of these uh, passages, in light of this verse. 
let the text speak for itself. Birds don't sow, birds don't uh, reap, they are fed. So ask yourself more questions uh, regarding that. Um, when you're coming to verse 27, uh, is there any connection between what was said before or is he starting a new thought? It's still about being anxious and he uses a, a term in there, I don't know how you describe it, but it's, um, he uses length to compare it to time instead of saying you can't add a day or a week to your life. He's saying you can't add a yard or a, a, a unit of length. It's a, maybe like a figure of length. So there are things that are being uh, emphasized. There are things that are being repeated. Uh, he's using these ideas of incidents and circumstances. Uh, note all of those type of things. Uh, make sure that you are seeing the, the typologies, the birds. Uh, you've got this rhetorical question. And then he starts talking about, uh, you know, I will say us. Um, he, he's talking about his audience. Um, and he, he's using that as just carrying us along. What else do you observe about verse 27? <coughs> Utility of worry? Okay, that, that's getting definitely into interpretation. <laughs> Um, it's a rhetorical question. I mean, when he asks it, everybody knows the answer. Uh, is there anything in the text uh, that, that stands out to you? I, I'm not asking for a specific answer. I'm actually asking, uh, is there anything in verse 27 that stands out to you? Any of the ways, the words themselves, uh, the phrases that he uses, anything that stands out? Not the interpretation of the verse, not what you've been taught about the verse, but the verse itself. The answer can be no if it's, there's nothing. There's one that's kind of redundant, you know, a single cubit, he could have said cubit, he's saying a single cubit, he's saying not even the tiniest little bit. Okay, yeah, I think that's a great observation. The only thing I guess I observe too is um, you know, in, in verse 25, you get a little bit, and he says, therefore I say to you, that kind of seems like a general you, and, and this might be a little bit of interpretation, so it's kind of wrong, but then in 27, it's like directly, like, which of you, it seems like more emphasis on the you, like a little more direct than... I I think that goes along similar to what J.W. adds. He, there's an emphasis with the very way the words are written uh, that is, is putting this squarely on an individual where you might have, um, and you can look into the Greek and find out, are we now talking about a singular you or are we talking about a plural you? The very terms that are being used. J.W. Po uh, pointed out a really good one. He doesn't just say a value or a unit but he, he uses a qualified unit. Again, he's giving us uh, something that, that's emphasized. Uh, it's a quantitative, uh, a single hour to his span of life. So I, I think that's interesting. For me personally, I, I always find it interesting when I'm reading the text of scripture and I see gender specific language, um, you know, his life, um, it, it, it would just be something to note. Uh, Jesus is, is speaking to a crowd of people, um, and yet he uses the, the individual, uh, not you all, uh, he uses the individual his, or you know, the singular uh, pronoun uh, his. So it's, it's something to notice that uh, the very words that are being used are intentional. Uh, a little bit of a pattern. Um, from the beginning it says, uh, you will eat or what you will drink, nor your body. So first we talk about something about eating. And then uh, it skips down to 31. Yep. Uh, clothing uh, for the uh, grass, right? <coughs> uh, verse 30 and 31. Yeah. So 
kind of trace back to the uh, to the beginning. So there's kind of a it shows you the direction, and then it kind of goes back to those, or it goes deeper into those. We see a lot of parallels in in uh, the the book of uh, Proverbs. Um, in similar ways, where one one thing will be stated and then it will be stated in a slightly different word order, uh, but it's the same concept. Uh, observations to make for repetition again. Uh, verse 28, anything that stands out in that verse? What, what do you notice? What do you observe? Well, and then clearly, like he's talking about the lilies, again, just similar comparison to the birds, you know, that they grow, yet they, they don't do any work. Okay, so, you know, he's brought in a new concept. Um, so pay attention to that, that new concept being brought into the text of Scripture. Um, do you know what a lily is? If, if you don't, that's a term you might need to look up. You might be needing to identify what is a lily um, if you are not familiar with the fact that it is a flower. Uh, it is not a bird of the air, a living creature uh, that was created, uh, but rather it is, it's a plant of the field, and it identifies it as a lily of the field. Um, so that might be something you need to, to be aware of. Also, given a word picture with both the birds and with the lilies, he's giving them human, human characteristics of birds sowing and reaping, and lilies um, making a living or spinning. They do not toil or this. <laughs> yeah, so he's giving them like human characteristics. Yep. Yeah, the big, the big word for that, the anthropomorphizing uh, yeah, of these things. Uh, we we can use <laughs> we can use the the small words to say. You know, we don't humanize them, uh, typically, uh, and yet, even without being humanized, they have everything they need. So, uh, pretty, pretty neat how Jesus uh, uses different uh, classifications. You know, if you're an ornithologist and you love birds, he, he's grabbing your attention. It's something we're all familiar with. Uh, if you're, a, a, you know, somebody who likes plants, whatever those people are called, I can't think of the word right now. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> Horticologist, there we go. I uh, heard somebody say it. And uh, so you have that idea, he's grabbing attention. Maybe, maybe something worthwhile to note, to, to follow down, uh, to track down questions and say, um, are these common uh, to that area for your interpretation section later? Uh, so to, to find out if this is something that happens, you know, it happens to be in the area of Israel at that time. Um, if, if you're not familiar with uh, making a list of questions to ask, uh, start doing that. Start asking yourself uh, questions. Some of them are going to get scrapped off. Uh, some of them you are going to keep and, and track down answers to. Um, is there a language change in verse uh, 28 at the beginning? Or is this the same style of question that he's already asked? No, in the previous one, they gave a statement first and then a question, rhetorical question. Right? In this one, it, at least in my, and okay. I'm assuming my translation it starts out with the question and, and then the statement. Mine has not just the question, but it's so why. And I think that so is important because it places like emphasis on, like, we know all of this. Now, like, because you, you know what I just told you, so why? Yeah, so if, we are, if we're talking in terms of rhetorical questions and implied answers, we've got another rhetorical question with an implied answer. Um, and so you know, maybe you need to, to make a note of that and, and track down what is this rhetorical question implying. Um, in verse 28, what, what is the rhetorical question implying? I think that's the second of three... There's an argument from lesser to greater. Okay. He says the birds. He takes care of the birds. He's going to take care of you. He takes care of the lilies. They're you know they're going to be clothed like Solomon does the grass. And so it's like three of those three makes that argument. Hmm. Um, what are the these rhetorical questions? What are the implied answers? Will be things you'll need to track down. Uh, verse twenty nine. 
What does, what does Jesus do in verse 29? What do you notice in the text? He's assuring us. He makes a comparison between Solomon. Okay, who is Solomon? Of the kingdom of Israel, who's at the top, everything was at its best. Okay. Well, he starts out to. I don't think we want to overlook uh, how he starts out the, the verse, right? And yet I say to you. Yeah, that's what she just pointed okay. out. Yeah, but it's, yes, it, take notice of the language. Yes. I mean, I guess he did in verse twenty-five. I say to you, but there's uh, some implied authority. Yeah, there's, there's greater emphasis going on. And, and what is the emphasis? What does the text say? Well, Solomon in his glory, right? In clothing. Okay. Solom Solomon in his glory was not what? I'll do him. Yeah. And so... So again, want to make sure we're, we're delineating who is Solomon, what glory did he have, where would we find that? Okay. Uh, specifically, did anybody track it down? Anybody make note out of it? Okay. And, and, you know, for your, for your actual, if you were going to be teaching a lesson on this, you might need to go back and do some of that legwork. But for your own uh, ability to be able to know, all right, where was Solomon? Uh, you know, he, he was pre-1 Kings 18, Elijah on Mount Carmel, if you remember kind of some of the big events going on. Uh, so you can write down 1 Kings 9 and what was going on around then and track that down later. If you don't have those, those references in your head, that's okay. Um, you know, not all of us had the opportunity to go to school and they drill, you in the, drill that into you. Um, but reading and, and being able to use reference literature to be able to find that out, that will come in to the context of what's going on uh, in interpretation. So as far as uh, the glory that's being talked about, uh, what do you notice about what Jesus says? He, he, I don't know if anybody said this. He says Solomon in all his glory. So he, I mean, it's in his in his human nature, his glory. And in the previous, uh, talking about the, oh, I guess it was the, the birds, where he talked about the Heavenly Father feeds the birds. Okay. Uh, so there's, now we're bringing in two, the, the two dichotomy, like, or the uh, viewpoints of man building his own glory and God providing for the, you know, the birds and the, and, and he doesn't, he, I guess we don't want to take this out of context, but interpreting the, the lilies of the field, he doesn't say that the Heavenly Father is the one that. But he does later but, on in verse 30, if God so clothes the grass okay, of the yeah. field. It, he's he's going to yeah he's going to address the the fact that God does that um, one of these and, and so the these points back to the previous verse it's not in verse twenty nine where we identify the these so be aware of that that language um, that he's using this this pointing back to verse twenty nine uh, twenty eight in verse thirty uh, what do we notice uh, what what does it begin with what does it say. Uh, what are some things we need to observe? So, but, so therefore he's answering something that was previously addressed. But if God, and also it's the, the first mention of God. Um, but gives us a what? But. It's a contrast, yes. You have a contrast. And anytime there's a contrast with God, 
uh, being the, the one doing the work. Take great notice of that. Underline it, highlight it. Make sure that you are aware uh, of the contrast that is being made. And so what is the contrast uh, is a great question to ask. Keep it really simple and then being able to answer it succinctly uh, for, for your own understanding of the text and what you are observing there. Uh, what do you observe here? Because it says, like, all the leaves, you know, with, like, um, their glory, and then, like, in the other verse, it's saying, well, just the grass, you know, that's going to be burned away. So it's like God gives glory, and God, you know, takes away the glory. So uh, it, I, I like where you're going with that. Um, that is definitely going into the, to the realm of interpretation. Uh, but you, you are pointing out that, yes, that the lily is not... The, the capstone, the lily is not the peak of what it is. It's just grass. Um, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, what does he say about the lily, about the grass? What does he say that God does? He says it's alive today and thrown in the furnace tomorrow. Okay. Uh, any, anything we need to be aware of uh, in, in regard to that, uh, to that passage, to that text? That argument again. If, it, if he orders it to be, and it's a second later, it's trash. Then he makes the argument that, well, that's insignificant. He's going to do all this for you. How much more is he going to do for you? And yep. Again, that argument. That's the third one, the lesser to the greater. And I guess the other piece is that when he finishes that verse, this is like the first time you see old men a little faith. It's like, where did that come from? Yep. <laughs> A new element being put into the text, yes. Uh, another um, uh, rhetorical question being asked. Um, it, is, it is significant to note the text. It is significant to also note uh, there's a language change in, in verse 30 at the end. Uh, it is future. Uh, will he not? So just be aware uh, the the language being used. Um, you've got something going on in the text that changes from what has been stated. Do you notice anything uh, about verse thirty uh, that is striking uh, in regards to? To the passage, anything else that stood out to you uh, in this verse? Yeah, what, what stuck out to me was the fact that he called their faith into question. He was talking to them about not being anxious. Faith was his big finger to the chest. There is an element of quantity when he says, um, well, we know much more. Yes, yeah, it's quantitative again. Much more. Good. It's a good observation. I don't know if this is in reference to interpretation, but there is a, an element of eternity or the eternality of, of the grass and ourselves, which is alive. And tomorrow is thrown into the oven, whereas we all experience some kind of eternity okay. versus grass that doesn't. Definitely, uh, definitely interpretative, but but is definitely uh, a point made in scripture. So, uh, now you know, this this might kind of go in the same realm. So tell me, if I'm, but he seems to place. Okay, we we get this temporary uh, sense of temporariness on on the grass. Right, it's here today, gone tomorrow, it's, and then, but yet it's created in glory and arrayed in, in beauty. Um, and then, so he compares this temporary thing, and again, looking not much more clothe you. There seems to be a value placed there. On, on you, you know, the, the you he's talking to. The, the hearers are definitely, by the rhetorical questions, valued, absolutely. Um, an application that will be a very easy thing to draw directly from the text. 
Yes. Also, I don't think it's an accident that it goes from lilies to grass. Grass is more common. Lily might be a little bit more. Yeah. Or was that? Yeah. Saying? No. Well, that, that's good. It's good to it's good to repeat it. Um, I also wonder, like having grown lilies myself, when they're not in bloom, they look like grass. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so that's something I didn't know. So. There you go. Like when I first moved into our house, I was like, oh my gosh, they have all this like long grassy stuff in my garden. Ugh, I don't like that. Turns out my garden was full of daylilies, which I should have realized. That's a small flower. Okay. So you, you're, that's going to be an a interpretive uh, issue that you're going to want to deal with with the text. What, what is the Greek word in this case um, that is being referenced? Yeah, has a belt and dealt with previously in, yeah, in you know. Talking about worry and anxiousness. And so. There's some connection being made to faith. Hmm. I think there's a lot of value to the point that he's pointing out, like, our, the way we are fallen and our fallacy and, or how we deal with things and pointing out the undue anxiety that we have. And then it leads to putting our faith in him. Like a mindset. Yeah, that, there's a lot here uh, when it comes to application uh, that we can be doing. Uh, and he's going to deal with this uh, in the next verse. So what do we see in verse 31? Okay. Before that? All right. So you need to be aware and comfortable with, with handling the text that's previous. Um, you know, the old adage, if you see a therefore, go back and see what it's there for. Um, it, is, it, it is a really helpful saying, just to be able to make the, the legwork of what is before this passage. Um, once you get to this passage, in, in our case tonight, we're familiar with what's come before. And so, uh, it's already been said, Tim, what is it? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Joel, you said it. Sorry. Yeah, it's a command. Yep. Looks like right now he's starting to wrap things up, and what you're getting is a bookend of it. Because you, you get the, it starts off in 25 with do not be anxious, and now you're going to get do not be anxious, and then in 34, therefore do not be anxious again. So it's starting to wrap up. And and does he, uh, I, won't, I won't ask that question. What does he say not to be anxious and, and not to do? Have we seen that previously? Okay, where? Okay, so just being able to get that in your head. Um, that, yes, we have seen this again, and here's where we saw it again. So, you know, cyclical is not always bad. We hear a lot of uh, arguments are, that are cyclical and they're bad. This is an argument that's cyclical in the sense of he's telling us not to do something he's already introduced, and he's telling us don't, don't do this so much he reemphasizes it. All right, and uh, how does he tell us to not be anxious? By not saying. Is that what you mean? Like, sure. Like, First, we're to seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and that's supposed to, you know, propel us into the right way of thinking. He draws an example of what the Gentiles. So, are you familiar with, with Gentiles? Do you get the concept? Do you know what Gentiles are? Can you, can you define them? I believe they're non-Jews. They are the, it's not just, it's those who don't have the Okay, so they're non-Jews. Uh, they are... In, in the context, um, we got to be careful and be cautious to say that they're not believers um, in the sense of we want to be, we want to be 
dealing with the text as it's before us. But yes, they are, they are non-Jews. And, and what, does, uh, what does Matthew tell us about uh, the Gentiles? They seek after What things? What, what to eat, what to drink, what to wear. Yep, yep, what to eat, what to drink, and what to wear. There we go, yep. You know, just really, really basic, simple questions that are so important because we want to tie everything we do to the text. We don't want to go, well, they're, you know, they're, they're seeking a, a kingdom that's coming from uh, Rome. We, they're seeking, you know, this and that. That's not what the text says. Jesus is dealing with a very specific line of thought Eat, drink, wear, the Gentiles seek after eating, drinking, and wearing. That's what the text says. What is the, uh, what's the, 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 sorry, I'm dropping the term. Um, what is the relationship between 31 and 32? So that's going to be an interpretation, but we are going to note certain things. So we want to be aware enough to know what is going on when we're talking about a text. Um, so we've got Matthew who is writing. Uh, he, is, he is quoting Jesus. But we want to be careful to not go so much uh, into the cultural background that we start diving an interpretation of is talking about the fact that, you know, this is Jesus speaking to uh, a Jewish audience with Matthew writing to Jewish believers about the Messiah and post-resurrection, sec Second Temple Judaism, um, you know, the, the temple has been rebuilt, Herod, who is half Jewish, you know, is, you know, he's got these guys called the Sadducees who are in charge of the temple. That's all interpretation. So we just want to keep we want to keep that line really careful because that's going to start giving us some, some perceived implications of what's going on. Because we could easily start tracking down what we know about the Gentiles from that information which that would lead us away from the text. We want to stay really tight with the text of non-Jews seek after eating, wearing, and, and drinking. We are told not to. We are commanded not to um, seek after those things first, but rather we are commanded to not be anxious and, and to recognize something else. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I think it's also, you know, again, referencing back to when we talk some verses 19 through 24, repeating kind of verses about where your heart is and what you're seeking. Um, and there's a reference to treasure and, and heart. And then you contrast that again with the Gentiles who got here. Let's talk about being anxious and look. And you say that these are the things that they value, these earthly treasures. And I just told you, <laughs> get your heart on the things above, and this is how you do it in the next, in the next command. Yep. And, and, you know, when it comes to the Gentiles, we're going to start seeing, all right, let's go back and let's see what has Matthew already said in interpretation about the Gentiles. Um, and we can dive into some of those things because he's already talked about them. Uh, in Jesus' account, in, in this chapter 6, verse 7. Uh, but in the text that's before us, we want to tie it to the text and keep it really narrow. Basically, stay in your lane. Uh, and your lane is this passage. Um, in, in regards to the Gentiles seeking after these things, what questions uh, come to mind that we need to answer uh, for the rest of verse 32? What are these things? Okay. If we already answered. Yep, we answered that. Well, I guess the question in my mind is, they seek these things, what's the result of them seeking? I mean, that's like a question to start to think of right now. I'm like, I don't think we're getting an answer. Yeah. To search, think through interpretation later. 
I was trying to not play my hand and give you the end, to look at the end of the verse in case anybody's, you know, trying to find something I'm fishing for in the beginning of that verse. I'm not fishing for anything in the beginning of that verse anymore. Well, your heavenly father knows that he needs, you need those things. Who's heavenly father? I, your, so the person, the people being spoken to. Okay. Um, there's, there's an emphasis there. Jesus could have said, your father, uh, the Father in heaven. He, he could have said, God in heaven, the, the King of heaven. Uh, but he personalized it. Uh, so note that, your Father in heaven, or your heavenly Father. Uh, what about your heavenly Father? Okay, so... So what is that, what questions is that going to make us ask? Or is, I mean, is it going to make you ask any questions? I think that both as believers we know this, but for an unbeliever to then see what God knows about them, that that's pretty powerful if we don't already understand the concept. Hmm. Excellent thoughts, completely application and, and interpretation. Um, but, you, but I mean, very, very good interpretation application. Um, you know, things to write down, things to, to make note of. How does he know them? Why does he know them? Uh, why does he know about me? You know, those are things you're going to answer in interpretation and in application. Yeah, I was also just thinking now, the use of father <clears throat> describing God, like that familial term, you know, like just observing that it's used and then an interpretation, I might say, why is that used and what, where does that lead me? But just noting right now, it uses the term father to describe God. He, yes, uh, make note of that, uh, pay attention to that. Uh, and, and those are gonna be things that you're going to draw out of other passages in interpre interpretation and application, absolutely. Uh, and again, we're in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew has already dealt with the fatherhood of God uh, in light of Jesus' words uh, in the Lord's Prayer. So, you know, that would be a contextual thing that you are, you are going to have to deal with. What does the text say that the Father knows that we need? All of them, not some of them. All of them, all of these things. Yes. Uh, so making sure you are, you are noticing the emphasis of the text. All right, verse 33, what do we have? But, contrast. Okay. Contrast to the Father knowing. Contrast to not being anxious. And, uh, you know, the... See, but it, the 32 it talks about seeking those things, but seeking kingdom. So make sure you're paying, to your, your, you're paying attention <laughs> to the language construction. It is, it is a contrast that's specified. Um, you've got a contrast to the seeking. That's exactly right. And what what is the what does the text say? There's an order. So you seek first the kingdom of God, and then like everything's gonna gonna be added, be added to you. The kingdom and That's a huge topic. <laughs> and uh, we don't have time to dive into all of that. But that is a huge topic. Um, and, and those are things you're going to have to track down. Uh, what kingdom? What is the kingdom of God? Uh, also, is the first thing, almost like an is there an exclusivity in that? that it, it's so primary that it's mm. as if those other things don't matter. It's, is it, there's such an intense focus on the first that don't even look over your shoulder. Those will just be there. And it's and, not or, so it's a combination of two things, not one or the other. Yeah, so these would be parallel items uh, that we want to make sure that we are seeking uh, with intense focus. And we can get into interpretation and application of those uh, very quickly. Uh, what else uh, in verse 33? When he says old things, it's 
referring to the drain, the eating, what are we wearing? Is it going back to um, third one? Uh, yeah. When it is all, when it says and all these things, those things are like the basic needs. Those, those are going to be things that, that I'm going to take note of, that it's all things, uh, you know, and all these things will be added to you. And I would be asking myself, what things? Uh, the eating, the drinking, and the wearing. Um, and then in the interpretation, uh, we're going to be asking, is that the, the base needs only, or is it there is more uh, than that? So, but yes, in the observation, uh, we're going to see that it's the eating, the drinking, and the wearing uh, are going to be what? Is it uh, interpretation that to note, to observe that uh, eating, drinking, and wearing requirement for surviving? Uh, it, it's good to just to be aware and, and to make notes and observations. Uh, I would be careful to not dive into the, you know, um, hierarchy of needs and, and start thinking of uh, Abraham, uh, what was his name? I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I wouldn't start thinking of, of all of those things and, and being cautious to, to tie it in. These are basic things, eating, drinking, and wearing clothes. God knows about it. Um, verse 34, for the sake of time. Yeah, that third repetition, if you have not uh, gotten that this is important to Jesus, here's the point. And that's not interpretation, that's text. Although in verse 34, it has changed a little bit. Instead of worrying about eating, drinking, wearing, worry about eating, drinking, wearing, in 34, it's worry about tomorrow. Good observation, Lori. That's wonderful. What else does he bring in uh, in our closing moments? Very last sentence. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Bigger speech. Good. Good observation. But a new concept, right? Uh, we haven't been talking about trouble up until this point. Um, so maybe asking yourself, uh, why does he bring this in? Uh, and, and that's something to track down in interpretation. <coughs> Is anybody dying to give application to this for the Christian life? It's the tendency of spending time in the text. But be cautious to observe. And, and when you think you have observed every single connection, go over it again. And so let's, for the sake of time, uh, let's read this passage out loud. If somebody would read it. Uh, boldly, uh, as we read Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body and what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father <coughs> them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which, is, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore, not, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will, shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Father God, even as we hear the rain pouring down and we think of the kids from Woodland Village and those who did not come tonight, and as we think of our own friends and family uh, who are traveling, uh, we could easily be anxious. But we read what Jesus said. We read what you've preserved. Lord, let us turn our thoughts and our minds clearly to you. Let us seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness boldly. 
And let us be wise this night and in the nights to come to remember that you are the one who has given us all things you have clothed so well and provided above and beyond what we can ask or think. And we love you and trust you and will follow you in truth by your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much for observing the text.